Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. I am absolutely thrilled to have a a wonderful scholar, a a dear friend, a, a great thinker in how to make peace on the planet, talk about one of my favorite books, uh, not only of his, but of all books. Uh, I think it's an absolutely uh, splendid, uh, spectacular book and a a great read. And that is Aristotle's Children. The subtitle is How Christians, Muslims, and Jews Rediscovered Ancient Wisdom and Illuminated the Dark Ages. Richard, thank you so much for joining. Richard Rubenstein is uh, professor uh, emeritus uh, at George Mason University and has led wonderful programs on conflict resolution and peacemaking uh, at uh, George Mason and globally for for many many years so it's just an absolute delight to be together with you oh thanks so much jeff i I'm very happy to be here and as you no, I think you're one of my role models, and I'm very I'm delighted to be here to be able to talk with you about this book. Well, it's it's so much fun, and thank you so much. You know, I uh, consider myself uh, uh, an Aristotelian. Uh, I love and adore Aristotle. Uh, I think he gave us so much of uh, Western culture and ideas. Uh, I came to Aristotle relatively late in my career because uh, I thought as a young person when I was starting out in school, I just wanted to learn some math and how to pull the levers uh, on the economy. So I loved economics and uh, I had actually uh, walked across the hall uh, at Harvard in my freshman year from a course on political philosophy to uh, a course on uh, mathematical economics and how I got started. So it was only uh, many years later that I came to uh, absolutely uh, love and appreciate Aristotle and ancient Greek wisdom and what it means for all of us. So I want to start asking, what about you? Uh, Was Aristotle an early love uh, or how did you come to a whole line of work uh, uh, because uh, you have written beautifully, uh, wonderfully on early Christianity, on uh, Aristotle, uh, on uh, uh, another wonderful book uh, on uh, the uh, Hebrew prophets uh, of yours. So how did you come to this uh, line of, uh, of inquiry? Well, I really came to it through just as you as you're suggesting. I came to it through being interested in religion and religious, and, in particularly in religious conflict. Um, mm-hmm. I was t- I was teaching um, uh, and still am connected with, um, although I'm an emeritus professor, and I was connected with uh, the Jimmy Carter School of uh, uh, Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. And um, and I be, become fascinated by the problem of religious conflict in our own society, as well as in on, in the world in general. Uh, I had earlier on I'd written some books on terrorism, and um, I got more and more into thinking about why religion, which is supposed to be a a, 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 a cause of peace, you know. Yes, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the better side uh, of, uh, of us. That's right. How come it had, had it become such a such a bone of contention for so many people around the world? Um, and I was I was um, so I wrote a book called When Jesus Became God, which was a, a book about the Aryan controversy. And I wrote that book because I wanted to know why what what looked like a hair-splitting theological controversy that should have been worked out by by priests or monks, you know, in there, in in talking with each other, ended up being a conflict which burned down cities. Uh, it was a conflict over the nature of Jesus's divinity, um, and um, so I, that it made me wonder how why do religious matters become how do they become linked with social conflict and how do they become so destructive and so violent? So 
So after I wrote that book, by the way, how immediately relevant in these weeks and months? Uh, yeah, I'm with, afraid with, so. I'm with, afraid with, so. With, with the new war in uh, Israel and Palestine, it's uh, terrible. But so much yeah, religious we, underpinning to this. We absolutely we need to get back to that because this this what happens in this book and Aristotle's children is that really what I expected to be another war story turns out in a way to be a kind of peace story. Mm -hmm. um, when I started writing the book, I mean, I, got, I, I was interested in the fact that, the, the, as, as you know, the works of Aristotle, which had been lost to Western Europe, most of them had been lost to Western Europe for a long, long time after the collapse of the um, Roman civilization, and the so-called Dark Ages, the Arist Aristotle's work were, were, were rediscovered in Spain when the Christian knights and Christian rulers went into Spain to tra take Spain back from the Arabs, from the Muslims, who had controlled it for 400 years. Um, they discovered, you know, not a backward civilization, but a a civilization in many ways more advanced than their own, uh, in which, among other things, the Muslims had translated the works of Aristotle into Arabic and had, and not only the works of Aristotle, but of other Greek geniuses, like the Galen, the founder of medicine, and Archimedes, you know, the founder of engineering, and all of that. Well, Aristotle was one, but for 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 Christians or for people interested in 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 good and evil and how to live and uh, and also people who are becoming interested again in nature, all the because during the during the, the hard years in Europe, uh, the years of foreign invasions and great and poverty and all of that, uh, there was not a great deal of interest in nature. Uh, but interest in nature revived in connection with developments that were transforming Europe, increasing agricultural production, increasing population, creating cities, um, creating universities, a kind of revival of culture in Europe in the 12th and in the 11th and 12th and 13th centuries, which some people call the medieval renaissance. Um, well, what happened was when the Christians went into Spain and they found all of this stuff, Aristotle's writings on nature, Aristotle's philosophies, Aristotle's ethics, uh, Aristotle's writings on the soul and the rest. Um, it was, it's been called the most the most revolutionary intellectual discovery in Western history. And it, and it probably was. It probably was. It's an amazing moment. And uh, let's take a pause here just for one moment to give uh, listeners a, a sense of the chronology of all of this, uh, just so that they have the background. If, if I could be very uh, quick in this and please uh, jump in at any moment. Sure. Just to say that uh, Aristotle uh, lived in the fourth century uh, BC in ancient Greece. Uh, he was, of course, the student of Plato, who was the student of Socrates. And Aristotle's uh, great works were uh, especially between 350 BC and uh, his death uh, in uh, 323 BC, I, I believe it is, or 324. Uh, but in any event, uh, this great, great genius, I would say, uh, you know, perhaps the greatest of all geniuses of the Western world. Uh, wrote uh, it, it towards the end of the fourth century BC, and together with the Platonic influence and other Greek schools of thought, uh, the uh, Stoics uh, and uh, uh, the Epicureans and others uh, had a profound and lasting uh, influence on Western civilization, including. Uh, not only the Greek era, but then the Hellenistic era that followed with Alexander the Great, and then the Roman uh, period, the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. Uh, 
Then very quickly, when uh, as Christianity rose and the Western Roman Empire fell, that was a kind of uh, double uh, whammy to Greek thought because uh, Christian uh, theologians uh, were skeptical or uh, radically antagonistic in many cases to pagan philosophy and pagan knowledge. Uh, and the Roman era, which had embodied the Greek intellectual thought, had disappeared in the West. And so, as you said, uh, Aristotle's texts uh, disappeared from the Western Mediterranean region, uh, survived in the Eastern Roman Empire, and much of which was then conquered by the new Muslim rulers. And the Muslim rulers were extremely interested in Greek knowledge. Uh, they wanted to suck up all the knowledge they could find from uh, ancient Greece and Rome, uh, India and elsewhere. And so some of the greatest learning was in the, uh, the, the golden age of uh, Islamic philosophy and Islamic thought in, in Baghdad, uh, in other centers of uh, uh, Arab uh, scholarship in ancient Cairo, Fostat. Uh, in the medieval times and in Spain under uh, the uh, caliphates, the Umayyad uh, caliphates uh, of uh, uh, the Muslim conquerors. Then, as you said, a reconquest uh, took place over several centuries in which uh, Spain uh, was returned, one could say, to the Christian rule that had been the case of the Roman period before the conquest by uh, the Arab and Islamic rulers. And uh, you pick up the story there. Uh, the, as you say, uh, all of a sudden, <laughs> this unbelievable wisdom in the form of uh, Arabic translations of ancient Greece, it's like discovering the world's greatest library suddenly that they had no idea existed in Western Europe. And and that's uh, where this incredible story of yours uh, takes off. Yeah, good. Thank you, Jeff. That's a perfect, perfectly wonderful summary uh, of the history that leads up to this. Um, and you mentioned that um, that the Christian thinkers, the early Christian thinkers, would consider this kind of thing pagan philosophy, and they would be suspicious of it. Uh, and and we're suspicious of it uh, for lots of reasons. Um, so I knew that before I started doing this research. And, and so really what I expected to find was a kind of old-time battle between fundamentalists and modernists or the equivalent. You know, I, was, I expected to find the Christian... Uh, dogmatists resisting Aristotle and uh, the Aristotelians being kind of like, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a intellectually, I guess I'm a child of the sixties, you know? So I, right. so I have Arist <laughs> Arist and, and I, in my book, I talk about Peter Abelard, who is a, 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 a great teacher at the University of Paris, who was a kind of rock star, was a, really a, almost like a 60s character in some ways. Um, and really, I expected to find a great battle between the kind of Christian fundamentalists and the Aristotelian modernists. And then I was very surprised to discover that that's not really what happened at all. Um, that, that, that at the beginning, that's what happened. Um, the 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 Christians go into an, the great Muslim cities of Andalus of Spain, which I have to say, in some ways, um, I'm really tempted to to recommend another book to people who are listening to this. There's a book by uh, a woman uh, un, who died recently, unfortunately, named Maria Rosa Menocal, uh, called "The Ornament of the World." And it's about this Spanish civilization that was really, in some ways, 
you know, you don't want to over, you don't want to sentimentalize it and and exaggerate things. But it, in some, it was a magnificent civilization. Absolutely. In some we ways, were just in uh, Cordoba, in uh, Sevilla, yeah. uh, in Toledo, unbelievable beauty. It, it, it is, and it was a place where um, it was a place where the the Arab rulers uh, had learned to tolerate, even more than tolerate, even to encourage. Uh, a kind of cultural diversity it wasn't it wasn't um, it wasn't problem free, but um, it could, could, especially comparing that with what happened in Europe later on, it was a golden age uh, where Christians and Jews um, and um, uh, and Muslims and all kinds of ethnic groups as well could live together in peace and discuss things with each other. At any rate, this. This uh, kind of collaboration made possible the translation of the of the works uh, of of uh, Aristotle uh, from Arabic. They had already been translated um, by into into Arabic in other places in the in the Arab Empire. Um, but now, how the question was how they were going to get translated into Latin. So you had a situation in which you had. Jewish, Arab, and Christian scholars working together to translate these works from Arabic uh, into Castilian, and then from Castilian into <laughs> into Latin. Um, and it, anyway, it's a it's a really wonderful story. And one can actually see in Toledo the place where this uh, large translation factory that's, that's was, was underway. Um, so. Um, so as and then you have luck, kind of historical uh, contingency. You have luck, as luck would have it. All of this was happening when Europe was had reached a point that new ideas like this were going to spread and spread very rapidly. And these book these books, of course, there was no printing press yet, and they had to be copied by monks. But they copied thousands of. Of, of of them and spread them all over all over Europe. So as you said before, the initial reaction on the part of the European Christians was negative. And le and let's say why. The, the initial reaction was negative, not only because Aristotle was a Greek, was a pagan, um but uh and also a bit but because of certain things that he believed but also in some ways even more because of his attitude. The things that he believed that were um, controversial to Christians were things like the eternity of the universe. Aristotle thought probably the un every cause, every effect is the result of a cause, he said. And therefore... Uh, if every effect is a result of a cause, you have a, you can have an infinite chain of causes and effects. Um, when I say that every effect um, has a cause, and that that's kind of that's one of the fundamental doctrines of Aristotelianism, then I'm also pointing at something else. Aristotle was such an interesting guy. He was, in in one way, one of the first empirical scientists. He was particularly interested in biology and um, living in Greece and stuff. He was in, he was interested in, especially in the, in sea life and he was interested in plant life. Um, so with incredible powers of observation and that, also dissection of uh, the, the, the animals and plants and embryology is <laughs> stunning. That's right. So I think what so the first thing to think about just as being an Aristotelian uh, uh, characteristic is this kind of concentration, this kind of focus um, on the natural world, and really wanting to observe, really wanting to see what was going on there. For example, is is that if you're looking at something in the natural world, is that just one thing, or is it composed of parts? And if so, what are the parts? And how do the parts relate to each other? You know, that sort of thing. And so when I say that there is some resistance to this sort of thing on the part of Christians, I'm, what, what I'm getting at is in Europe for centuries, 
where the main your main job is to survive um and where life is really very is really very tough and you manage to survive and you seek consolation for for this really short brutish uh etc um life in in thinking about uh the life to come um so man you know the old saying man is born suffers and dies and uh, so what you're thinking about is how can i live a a relatively controlled and a, a somewhat decent life as long as i've got the life but how can i then how can i die well and go to heaven um and that sort of otherworldly cast of thought, which really lasted for a long, long time in Europe, is challenged by people who say, wait a minute, look at this, look at this fish, in the, you know, how come it, how can it breathe underwater? <laughs> and I mean, for a really a long time, I think the attitude in Europe was, who cares? I mean, that we're worried about how we're going to make it to the, till, till tomorrow with the Vikings invading and, you know, and everything else that's going on. Um, so Aristotle's attitude is one of intense interest in the natural world, coupled with a feeling that we belong here, that the natural world is our home, and that we have to, we have some relationship. We're natural too. We have some relationship to nature. Um, and this is where Aristotle disagreed with his with his great teacher Plato, because Plato was always talking about how what what we see in the world isn't really real. What's really real are the ideas that stand behind all of this, that the principles. That uh, so Aristotle had had a complicated relationship with Plato, who was his teacher, uh, but his emphasis was always on no, this is we belong here. Um, uh, we need to figure out what our relationship with nature is. And there's also another implication in this. We can be happy here. Not only is this our home, but it's a place where if we handle ourselves reasonably and correctly uh, and with some sensitivity to other people's needs, um, we, uh, we can be happy. And I, just to add, uh, for uh, people to take a look at one of the most wondrous uh, works of art, uh, the fresco by Raphael uh, in uh, the Vatican uh, of the School of Athens, because at the center of that uh, great picture, uh, which is actually the cover of your book, uh, yeah. I'm just uh, realizing yeah. again, yes. Yes, uh, is, is uh, Plato uh, pointing upward. And Aristotle, uh, with his hands forward, uh, Plato uh, saying, it's the ideal world. And Aristotle saying, no, we, we remain down yeah. down on Earth. Yeah, uh, true. And interestingly, uh, Plato carrying one of his dialogues, the Timaeus, uh, and Aristotle carrying the ethics under his arm. Uh, so it's an absolutely wonderful, uh, fantastic picture, but uh, but the wonderful cover of, of your your book. So it is Aristotle down to earth. And so what happens when this reaches Paris, uh, this, this, uh, these uh, new ideas of the practicalities, the happiness, the, uh, the groundedness of uh, Aristotelian thought? Well, what happens is so interesting because it's sort of, it's an illustration of the, really of the impossibility of legislating ideas. Or the impossible, the impossibility of limiting ideas. Um, I think, you know, sometimes we, these days, especially, we kind of, can, uh, we assume, um, we assume the, the, the efficiency of totalitarianism or the, uh, the possibility of, we, we're very aware that some people have, a few, a few people have a lot of power and many people don't have very much power. And sometimes I think we can get pessimistic about that, thinking, well, if, if, you know, the people with power are going to tell us what to think and how to think. Um, but what happens in Paris is that the church initially, the bishops of Paris, 
initially says, you're not allowed to read this. Our Aristotelian stuff is dangerous um, because not only because of the attitude questions that we just mentioned, um, but because he's teaching things that are so logical that if there are things that we believe that aren't so logical or that don't seem that probable in a naturalistic sense, um, believing, reading Aristotle and believing what he, adopting his views on things will undermine, can undermine some basic Christian beliefs, um, like a belief in um, uh, the resurrection of uh, dead people. For example, Aristotle's view is if you, once you're dead, you're dead. Um, and so how, how can how can anybody be resurrected? That might become a question. Um, and, and all sorts of other beliefs that also uh, might might be might be questionable. So so the the bishops say you can't read this stuff. And uh, everybody reads it anyway. I mean, that's what's a, that's what happens is people are so interested that the, the whole culture is kind of coming alive and people want to see, well, what, you know, what does Aristotle say? And then they want to talk about it. And what's uh, interesting, and you mentioned it, and just to underscore, this is the moment of the birth of European universities. Uh, Bologna has come first. Uh, at the very end uh, of uh, the 11th century, uh, uh, but University of Paris soon after, uh, and other universities. So there actually are people reading. There are students. Uh, there are student groups uh, that uh, are organized. Uh, in fact, these early universities generally were kind of pickup institutions where groups of students would come together and find someone to teach them. Uh, so this was uh, like reading clubs in, in a way. Exactly. We found some really interesting, juicy stuff we want to read. We're going to talk about it. Right. So that's exactly what happens. And there are students. The, these, the universities are, say, even the University of Paris is in Paris. Oxford is, is in Oxford, England. But the students of these universities are from all over Europe, too. They come from all, they come from all over the place and they live in communities in ethnic communities that are known as nations. Um, and I, just as you say, they favor some, some teachers get big crowds. Other teachers don't get big crowds and have to, you know, find something else to do. Well, um, well, the, the interesting thing that happens then is that since two things are happening, one is generally the students want to read and talk about Aristotle. And they they don't they're not interested in talking about Aristotle. I'm thinking about the 60s again. We were interested in we were interested in reading Marx. Um because well we wanted to understand what was going on in Vietnam and other places and we thought that would help. But also we wanted to uh make trouble. Right. <laughs> we, <laughs> it good, was good a, trouble. Good trouble. It was it was it was kind of a rebellious act. And that really that really was not what was going on when the when the, uh, the Aristotelians in some I mean, let me say this it's kind of complicated but um mostly students were not interested in Aristotle because they were out of love with Christianity. You know, they weren't interested even even necessarily in reforming Christianity. They were interested in Aristotle, one, because they had become interested in nature and in life and in the potential, our potential to understand things. You know, the Great Revolution was a revolution of, of confidence in our ability to understand, to make sense of things. And so for a long time, that had been a very, a whole suspect a suspect activity. Um, and that is indeed what's so wonderful about reading Aristotle 2,300 years later, how logical, how systematic, how rational, how balanced, how judicious. Uh, it's true. amazing. It's an amazing thing. And it's uh, true. 
One one of the things about Aristotle also uh, <laughs> is that he always starts an analysis of any subject with the the best received opinion, a, a method uh, of his uh, that he called endoxa, which is what what do the knowledgeable people say about this topic? And it's exactly the method till today that we use in a scientific paper, where the first section of the paper is what is said about this topic. And so Aristotle started that. It's compelling because you're yeah. brought up to date on this range of issues. And yeah. then he goes into, well, here's uh, how to think about this. Yeah, I thought of that, too. You know, uh, Jeff, when I was in law school um, and we were taught in law school, um, if you're going to write a brief, what you, you've got to do is not, you not only make your arguments, you make the arguments for the other side. You, you anticipate what the other side is going to say and answer those arguments. And if you don't do that, you don't have a good brief. Well, Aristotle did that. He he and that became uh, under Catholic leadership in Europe. Um, that became um, part of the scholastic method. Exactly, you, uh, you, Aquinas' method. What are exactly. the three three objections to this? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, so what I was going to say was that these the students are not just being rebellious when they read Aristotle. They want to understand, but also they have a their faith tells them that God created everything. God created the universe. And whatever the universe contains, we're discovering God. It's a way of discovering God. Um, and uh, there can't really be any fundamental conflict between what science discovers and what God did. <laughs> because, because the... the um, the the last thing that any of them wanted to do was to be involved in a in a a heresy called the double truth where you would say well science says this but religion says that and they and they're opposite but they're both true that's no they said that's not and St Thomas's Thomas Aquinas's uh, the primary article of uh, his primary method an article of faith in a way was that there? There is no. There can't be any any fundamental conflict between the the religion as he understood it and science, exactly as he understood it. Right, and and uh, we hear that uh, actually from Pope Francis today. How that's right. Faith, faith and reason. Uh, of course, how could there be any conflict? So the image that we have uh, in uh, much of uh, our discussion that there is this pitched battle between uh, science and religion or between faith and reason uh, for these receivers of Aristotle, these students and these great scholars that you talk about was, no, uh, science is revealing God's work and God's plan. It's, it's the same. It's another way to read the book, the, the divine book. That's exactly. So, and of, of course, I mean, um, so let me give two illustrations of this, um, of two kind of two sides of this. One is, I, sometimes I think if I could go to any school, you know, be in any classroom at any time, where would I, where, where, where would I most like to be? I went to Harvard like Jeff did, and which is a, which is a wonderful place to study. Um, but I think if I could study any place, well, one place I'd like to, I'd like to be in Peter Abelard's class. <laughs> that was pretty uh, wild. <laughs> that's that's pretty, pretty one. interesting. <laughs> so I'll give you an illustration of what Abelard did. This was Christians using Aristotle to challenge certain Christian doctrines, but not the fundamentals of faith. And when I say challenge, I mean, challenge and restate, uh, reform, if you like, intellectually reform uh, Christian doctrines. So one of, one of um, Abelard's famous lectures is where he asks the question, he always starts with the question, and he asks the question, did the Jews sin in killing Christ? Um, 
he has he takes the gospel accounts of uh, the crucifixion, which lay a lot of blame on the Jews, not the Jews generally, by the way, but but Jewish leadership. Um, and um, and he says, well, that was that. Of course, that that was deicide. That's sinful. And that, as you know, became the basis for one of the basis for anti-Semitism in Europe for present for centuries and centuries was the charge of deicide that the Jews had killed Christ. So Abelard says it all depends what you think sin is. And the question is, the question that he asked to, to make a long story short is if you don't think he's he's God, if you don't think he's the son of God, can you be guilty of deicide? And the answer is no, not if sin is a matter of intention. If the if the primary factor in making a sin sin is that you do something knowing it's wrong, which, by the way, was St. Augustine's definition of sin. Um, sin, Augustine does the, the, a chapter in his Confessions where he talks about eating the pears on a pear tree, knowing he wasn't supposed to take those pears from the tree. And then it's not, you know, it's, Starts out kind of a joke, and then it becomes not a joke at all, because he says, "I want to do what I know I shouldn't," and that's the problem. And Abelard takes the same definition, and he says, "If the Jews sincerely believed that Jesus was just a guy and not not a you know not divine, they can't be guilty of deicide." Well, that to some people may seem today like common sense. It was it was semi-revolutionary in the in the, in in Paris. He didn't get into immediately into trouble over that. He got into trouble over trying to, to explain the Trinity um, in rationalistic terms. Um, but it was but it was a spectacular class and when the class was over, all of the commentators say the students went out in the streets and continued the discussion. <laughs> and the point was, let's just let's talk about it. There's nothing we can't talk about. Um, but I think actually, if I could go back to Paris and you know be around in those centuries, I would want to be. I think I would want to be in the 1240s or 1250s at the University of Paris when Saint Thomas was debating with Saint Bonaventure. <laughs> Tell us, and, tell and, us about that uh, briefly. And, and uh, others, well, well, that's where, you know, this is where, this is where Thomas uh, believed that human reason was divinely given to us. That one of the and, things and, and that just, just let me uh, pause for one moment to uh, explain. Sure. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, who was uh, one of the great uh, saints of uh, the Catholic Church uh, till today, uh, was a, a brilliant young uh, Dominican scholar uh, who uh, became a student of Albert Magnus, who was one of the giants in the reception of uh, Aristotle, uh, Albert the Great, Albert Magnus, and his student was Thomas Aquinas, who uh, arguably is the most important uh, Christian philosopher, uh, perhaps in, in, in history, I would say, and certainly in the church today, the, the uh, foundation of the Catholic Church's modern social teachings. And uh, I wanted just to read one, uh, wor one phrase from your book, uh, where the students mock the appearance of uh, Thomas Aquinas. So they, he's a big lumbering dumb. guy and they call him like a dumb ox and uh, <laughs> albert magnus is said to have turned firmly on the students to have rounded on them saying you call him a dumb ox i tell you this dumb ox shall bellow so loud that his bellowings will fill the world <laughs> it's uh, incredible because he did fill the world so back to uh, your classroom with thomas aquinas yeah, he's he's so. Anyway, I, it would have been something to hear him lecture. Um, um, he uh, uh, Thomas Thomas be believed deeply that that uh, 
reason was God's greatest gift to us. Um, he, uh, a belief, by the way, which at the end of his life, he, he also questioned. Uh, but anyway, I'll get to that in a second. In the, in the classroom and, and in debates with his uh, fellow monks and his fellows and with the students, um, Thomas was passionately uh, involved in trying to reconcile what we would now call science and religion. Remembering that, you know, Aristotle didn't make that distinction at all, that when Aristotle talked about the world, uh, his philosophy included much of what we would we would call now biology and, and psychology, um, but also uh, it, it included ethics and included philosophy. Um, he was not a specialist, right? He didn't. This is before the kind of separation of these disciplines, which has proved in, to us so in some ways very advantageous and in other ways a curse. But of course, Aristotle had to invent these disciplines first, which is true. amazing to me because almost everything he wrote was the first great text That's on true. a particular subject. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, so Thomas was an Aristotelian. Um, and what that meant for him was that if you could, you would look at nature and you would try to understand nature. Um, and there was no problem as far as he was concerned with believing that nature operated according to certain chains of cause and effect. Um, uh, that, um, uh, uh, that were totally natural. Um, but that uh, you could trace the origins of the of all of this back to God, that uh, God had put in into effect uh, a system in which causes produced effects in a in a in a in an explicable way in a rational way, um, and um, rational to Thomas didn't just mean something that was going on in our minds. It meant something that was going on in the universe. So when he was affirming that there was a, a, a divine source for all of this, he was also affirming um, that the universe was in some ways intelligent uh, and intelligible. All right. So, um, so our, this produced a few problems. One problem was how could you explain Christ? How could you be? How could you explain God becoming man and dying to uh, for the sins of of humankind? Uh, how could you explain that things were created out of nothing? Creation ex nihilo. Um, um, a couple of items like that, like like this. And his answer was: there are a few things you can't explain rationally. There are, there are some things which have to be accepted on faith, which Thomas said, but very few. Um, the existence of God himself, Tom, Thomas thought, could be proved rationally. Um, According to a kind of Aristotelian idea that there had to be a, a first, first mover, uh, exactly. a, a prime mover. Exactly. And then when it came to other things, like with, was the universe eternal or was the universe, was there a Big Bang? You know, was, was the universe created somehow out of nothing? Uh, Thomas got himself into some trouble with, with, with people. I mean, he was considered a radical. He became, he became the thinker of the church, the St. Thomas. But before that, he was considered dangerous. Yes, exactly. Um, and one of the things that made him dangerous was he said, well, you can't really prove logically that the, you, that the universe was created, uh, that you know whether the universe is 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 uh, eternal or not is something that you know you can't really prove one way or the other. Um, one of one of the things, Richard, uh, that as I was reading it, uh, first the debates, uh, and then uh, the fights over whether you could teach Aquinas or not, whether he would lecture, what writings were allowed. 
And and then most importantly, who would be hired next, a Dominican or a Franciscan? What what overwhelmed me in reading your text <laughs> was that this is like peering in on a, a, a faculty pure meeting, pure faculty <laughs> meeting from the from the year twelve eighty, and it's exactly the same. That's the faculty <laughs> meetings that, that 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 we have until today. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, it's, it's just a wonderful gossip also, and they're fighting with each other and fighting over tenure positions and who's going to come next. And uh, it's exactly what you expect and want of a university. <laughs> so anyway, this is this what this hap- what what happens is you have a period of time in which. In which. Um, science and religion uh, have kind of learned to live together. And when I say, and, and, and you might, you might ask, well, and what, and, and for one thing, it, it doesn't last forever. Um, Thomas himself at the end of his life decides not to write anymore because he has a religious experience. There are some accounts of that experience. Some are fairly strange. I mean, interesting accounts of people were claimed to have seen, to have seen uh, St. Thomas uh, um, kind of floating in the air and so on. Uh, but at any rate, he had, he said he had discovered things that he couldn't talk about. Um, and that he re- eventually retired to Sicily. He'd come from Sicily at the time when that was the cultural center of the world, Sicily. Kingdom of the Two Sicilies he came from around Naples, uh, but it was called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. He retired there, and he um, uh, and eventually died. Just uh, to not- mention, by the way, for the listeners, uh, this is the seven hundred fiftieth anniversary exactly <laughs> uh, in uh, twenty twenty four on March seven. Uh, he died uh, on his way. Uh, actually, to uh, what was going to be an attempt to bridge the schism that had developed in the church between the Western Roman Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and he died in a uh, oh, that's uh, in right. a monastery, Fasanova, uh, on uh, March 7, uh, 17, 1274. So we're at the seven hundred fiftieth anniversary uh, exactly uh, now. Uh, just a very poignant moment in a in a a, a poignant time but uh, wow. please uh, back back to you well no that's that's interesting thank you for that you reminded me of that thank you um so the other thing that happens is that is that the the, the aristotelian movement has produced produces um various great characters like peter avalard and then and 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 Thomas, but it doesn't stop there. It then produces people you might call left Thomas or or anti, maybe anti Thomas, postmodern Thomas, um, in which, um, in particular, two figures who I write about in the book, and I won't bother, you know, we won't talk in detail about them now, but Dun Scotus and William of Ockham. Uh, are brilliant Aristotelians who kind of t- start to turn in some ways Aristotle's own methods against him. So I have to I have to say that two things are happening at, at the end of the 13th century, or, or around the time Thomas Thomas dies. You have Christian philosophers like the ones I just mentioned, especially Occam, uh, who start saying things like, "Look." You can't say that God is God is causing all of the, the things that happen on earth, all that this natural law, which Thomas has believed so deeply in, both in just in terms of human law and justice, and also in terms of scientific law. He believed in the law was natural and law was from God. And William of Ockerman and others are saying, but wait a minute, God can do anything he likes. And the absolute power of God and the sovereignty of God means that all of, all of this could change any time, and that the everything is provisional. 
uh, the, the, yes, the natural laws are natural laws, but you can't, if, if, if they're laws of God, then they're always going to be the same. And also, you know them in a very absolute kind of way. But we're here to tell you, Occam says, well, I'm here to tell you that all of these things are provisional. They can, they've changed before, they can change again. And he started, when you read Occam, you, you, you start to, you know, you feel like you're reading someone more modern in some ways than Thomas. Um, because, and this is kind of opening the door to scientific relativism. And and doubt everywhere, and, and skepti- that's right. skepticism. And uh, David Hume, centuries later, saying, "Just because the sun rises uh, in the east every day, can you be sure that it will the next day?" Uh, that's so right. exactly, exactly. So, but the other thing, which is a mind blower, is that while all of this t- this philosophical and religious talk is going on in the University of Paris, you know what's happening to the University of Paris? The ph- the faculty is inventing physics. And people like John Buridan, uh, Oresme, and others are, they are doing experiments and theorizing about things like motion, in which they're questioning Aristotle, and they're doing it in a way which Aristotle himself would have approved of. Um, they're saying, wait a minute, we're, Aristotle says things are, if once you if you toss something in the air, it continues to move through the air for at least for a while because the air de- de- behind it is displaced and, and, and stuff. And uh, there's you look for a natural, you know, for something in the air, uh, an ether or something, which is pushing the object, which allows the object to continue going. Um, so you ha- you have these the scientists at the University of not the theologians they're all theologians at the at the University of Paris saying no but wait a minute uh, we've done various experiments and we're not finding any evidence that air is being displaced between behind objects that are moved in fact you can spin a top and you can see there's there's no displacement of air there and um, so let's be scientific like Aristotle was. Uh, and let's realize if you once you throw a thing into the air, it's going to continue to move for a while because you threw it. And we call we're going to call that impetus. Um, and we're going to not only can we say that's what's happening, but we can measure it. We can m- multiply the volume of what's being thrown by this the speed by the speed at which it's being thrown, and and you know and and. And this is happening 300 years before Galileo. So before Galileo gets into his big fight with the church over whether the sun is at the center of the universe or the, the earth is at the center of the universe, you have guys at the University of Paris saying, you know, the earth might be, the earth might be at the center of the universe because there's no way you can prove if, if because because whatever you think about motion depends on where you are, where you're doing the observation. That insight then gets proved, if you like, by Galileo. But the, the reason I'm mentioning this is because we're so often we think about science versus religion or science versus the church. Galileo fights this heroic fight and actually he's forced to recant after a while and, you know, um, and so we kind of think of, of faith, reason and faith as being as as always being in opposition. But these principles of physics were discovered at the University of Paris when it was under Catholic control. Exactly. And, and where I, everybody was a church, where everybody was in the was in the church. And and we could, by the way, uh, <laughs> jump forward and remember that uh, modern genetics was invented by a monk by uh, Gregor Mendel, <laughs> and there are countless examples uh, of, of, of exactly that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the interplay of religion and scientific advancement is very uh, complex and often uh, deeply synergistic. We, yeah. we, I, I, I'm sorry that we, I would love to continue for hours with you, but we're uh, coming close to the end of the time, I wanted to uh, jump several centuries to the present 
Uh, and just uh, on, on two points, one, uh, this advancement, as you say, turning Aristotle on its head, introducing skepticism, led to a, a kind of uh, uh, antagonism to Aristotle as an enemy of science for some centuries, which is one of the weirdest and un- most unfair judgments because Aristotle would have been the first to love these new observations, I'm absolutely sure. So I just yeah. wanted your quick take on that. And, and then second, I want to come back to Thomas Aquinas and our, our, current, uh, uh, our current world. But first, uh, just on this quick turn against Aristotle by early modern science, which I always found a little sad, a little peculiar. Uh, maybe you can understand from a polemics point of view, but it never seemed fair to me to Aristotle himself. Well, you know, they, and it wasn't. I mean, in the first place, what it, where it was fair was that some people who were Arist- who called themselves Aristotelians had become dogmatists. And they were so interested in protecting Aristotle or preserving some of the things that some of his principles that they were willing to do that even though all the evidence was that the principles were wrong. Aristotle had said that the heavenly bodies were all perfect spheres and um, by, and even conscious, and they even had consciousness. And Galileo turned his telescope, his brand new telescope, uh, on the moon and saw pock marks on the moon and, uh, and saw you know, other things. And said, "Well, this is not the this is not the kind of heavenly body that Aristotle was talking about, but there it is. It's on the in the telescope." So, our, some Aristotelians, people calling themselves Aristotelians, said, "There must be something wrong with your telescope because <laughs> Aristotle can't lie." So they had become anti, in a way, anti-Aristotelians. I mean, they had done what we you know we so often see in in philosophy and political philosophy, and especially people becoming dogmatic proponents of some uh, doctrine which has just been proved to be wrong. And that gave Aristotle a bad name. But there was something more important than that going on, and that is that Aristotle, Aristotle's association with the church, but also his association with um, uh, a, a, an attempt to harmonize science and ethics, um, had fallen out of favor with a new generation of Renaissance thinkers um, who call themselves realists. Well, they either call themselves realists or they call or Protestants. Right? And the the realists said, oh, "It's there's nothing but power. To, politics is power. Don't bother us with ethics." Um, you know so. So, um, uh, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, so Thomas Hobbes says. Thomas Hobbes says, if you're talking about moral law, Thomas Hobbes says that's a metaphor. There's only one law. That's the law of the state. <laughs> and if you're talking about moral law or any other kind of law, all you're doing is po- you're doing poetry, but it has nothing to do with the real world. So that vicious doctrine, we're still, we're still, we're still laboring under that, that vicious doctrine. I mean, some of my best friends are realists. I mean, I know, I know a couple of really good realists. Yeah. But, but goodness, that's really, it's, they, that was, that was a disaster. That, that Hobbesian separation of ethics and politics was a disaster. Um, so that was one. And then, we, then you have Martin Luther, which is a whole other story. Then you have Martin Luther saying, I hate Aristotle. Um, and because you're, re, you're saved by faith alone. And come on, we don't need all this, this reason. Let the people who want to do reason stuff go off in their corner and do it. But, you know, we're into... Um, his particular brand of Protestantism, which, by the way, many Protestants have have grown away from, but that well, that's a whole other story. So, so Aristotle had a bad reputation both from the realists on the part of the realists and on the part of the Lutherans. Um, let us some, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let us uh, come quickly uh, to the present. Uh, uh, thank you for the generosity of your time and all of these sure. wonderful <laughs> insights. Uh, Aquinas, uh, after uh, falling out for some time, and uh, Aristotle, after having fallen out for some time, was brought back to the very center of the church uh, in the end of the 19th century by Pope Leo XIII, who uh, started what is now uh, 135 years of encyclicals uh, called uh, Modern Catholic Social Teachings. Uh, starting with the uh, Rerum Novarum in 1891 and based very much on Aquinas uh, and with a lot of Aristotle mixed in. And I want to say that uh, what I find extremely exciting and gratifying about that body of uh, knowledge uh, and philosophy is that it brings ethics back into the core of our discussion. Uh, and the idea that uh, human reason actually can find a way to peace as well, uh, that reason uh, is, uh, uh, can, can be uh, something to uh, help uh, better lives uh, on, on earth. Um, and uh, I, I want to say we've come to the end of, of the time, but you have played a magnificent role and play a magnificent role in that idea. Uh, so not only are you a wonderful historian, Richard, but uh, you're a, a great moralist in the best sense of saying uh, we can do better and we can resolve conflicts. Uh, we can deal with each other. Uh, we can have good academic battles, no doubt, but uh, they don't have to turn violent. Uh, they can be uh, creative battles. So I want to end by paying tribute to all of your work and leadership and conflict resolution. Uh, Let's look for another chance to talk about some of that because uh, many, many okay. things to discuss and many things to learn. But we've had uh, more than our normal hour uh, on the book club. I'm sure everybody is listening with rapt uh, attention and gratitude to you. We've been discussing uh, Aristotle's uh, Children by uh, Professor Richard uh, Rubenstein, and uh, it's a fabulous book. But you could feel from this discussion, it, it gives you, it's like swimming in the 2,300 years of uh, Western thought. Uh, and uh, it's uh, an absolute joy. So let me, let me thank you so much, Richard, for uh, being with us today. And I'm sure that people all over the world are going to be grabbing their copies of this book and many others uh, of yours uh, um, with the, with, with the, absolute uh, delight and a uh, huge benefit. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really enjoyed being here and talking with you. I always enjoy talking with you. Thanks a million. We'll, we'll be together again soon. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>